Hey there, this is Dan. You're watching this Alt TC, and it has been quite a while since I've done a properly crunchy uh, war cry strategy video. The new expansion or edition, whatever we're going to call it, of war cry, you know, we've got that trailer, but it's it's so far in the distance that I think it at the moment it's probably safe to still talk about the current edition of the game and what we've got right now, what I'm going to talk about today, which is playing the objective, that's going to transfer over not just to, you know, the next edition, but a lot of the kind of principles here are going to transfer over, I think, to a lot of other GW games as well, because objectives and mission definitions are, uh, are kind of the name of the game with how they kind of structure their war games at the moment, which I think is a good thing. I think uh, a lot of these make for pretty engaging games. Yeah, so I'm just going to go over how to play these missions. You know, a lot of war gamers will tell you, you know, just play the objectives. Or when you ask, you know, why did I lose? They'll say, well, were you playing the objectives or were you just trying to uh, destroy your opponent's force, right? But that doesn't always, it's sometimes hard to hear that advice and understand what it means in actual applied games. And that's what I'm going to try to answer today. There's sort of a lot to consider. Ooh, when I uh, put that art there, I did not realize how gross it is. The correct balance of playing for points versus playing your opponent is really the balance we're talking about when we talk about playing the objective. And it's always going to be really matchup dependent. So I'm going to put a bunch of um, different objectives, mostly my favorite objectives on screen, and kind of go through some of the essential questions to ask yourself that are going to be true regardless of matchup. And then in some cases, I'll kind of talk about how they change uh, based on certain matchups. I've already put out some videos about how list building allows you to kind of play the objectives differently based on what lists you have. A lot of that is covered in the um, Lessons from Adepticon video and the How to Write a Solid War Cry List video that you can uh, check out in my archives. I'll link them down below as well. So now there's too many to cover each objective, right? But I'm going to talk about all six of the Tome of Champions missions, and then I'm going to cover some of my faves from each expansion of the game. Uh, the base game, Catacombs, Red Harvest, uh, just some of my favorite missions and how to play, uh, play to win those missions. And hopefully, by sort of seeing how I approach, I think I've got uh, about 14 missions total collected here, uh, seeing how I would approach all of those, hopefully that'll give you skills to kind of apply to any situation. And uh, I'm also really interested, uh, put in the comments, if you found strategies for some of these specific missions that uh, I didn't pick up on here, especially for some of the Toma Champion stuff, they're pretty new, and I'm interested to see how other people have been playing them. So I'm going to start with the treasure missions. Uh, this is Hidden Treasures and Forsaken Orrery. I'm going to be honest, I think both of these missions are pretty awful gameplay. However, the game is balanced as if treasure missions exist, so I wouldn't nix them all together. I've heard that the treasure mission in TOC 20 is a lot better. I've played it. It's the one where they uh, just put five treasures across the center, and um, that one's not nearly as auto win if you go first. Um, but let's first just talk about how to build towards treasure missions. The most important thing is having flying. Uh, dragons, dragons, dragons I put here because especially Forsaken Orrery, if you have a dragon in your shield and you go first, you win. There is nothing that your opponent can do to win the game. If, you know, something with more than 25 wounds or 25 wounds or more, if it's flying, it just grabs the treasure, runs away, uh, your opponent can never catch it. Even with another flying unit, you can usually play defense for it. Let's see if you can see my mouse here. Let's say I'm the blue shield. I've got a dragon. I grab the treasure and then I go into this corner where I know that my hammer is going to come in and help me out. Because um, if you retreat right backwards, uh, their dagger is eventually going to be able to do something. But if you retreat kind of this way, um, even if they have a flyer, the most they can do is get into combat with you, at which point, you know, you'll retreat here and then you'll have the rest of your shield come in and support. Their shield won't be able to fight, so then their flyer will be one-on-one -on -one with your flyer and your whole shield. Um, the game is essentially over. So these missions also support having what I call doggos. So sort of like fiends, griffhounds, frost sabers, 
uh, flesh hounds. They're all good here, these kind of uh, very mobile, somewhat fighty units that um, from a points perspective are easier to spread across your deployment zones, right? So that you can have one in each deployment zone. If you know you're gonna be playing a lot of treasure missions, then things like Fiend of Slanesh, Griffhounds, Frost Sabers, you know, all of those are much better than normal because you know you can have your one really threatening leader in one of your deployment zones and then uh, just have two in the others. Hidden Treasures is a little bit better a mission. It's not quite as auto win because you have these other treasures that come on later. It's really important if you go second, keep an eye on your opponent's extra treasures in case you can steal one. The time when I won Hidden Treasures going first, it was because I put so much pressure on my opponent's treasure carrier that they had to use their first activation to get Basically, I put them in a situation where they either can evacuate their treasure carrier or they can pick up their treasure, right? And so basically they had to make a decision about which one they were going to do. They evacuated instead of picking up, which I think was the correct decision because if you pick up first, then not only do I get a treasure, but I also get a kill. And so that is a way you can win hidden treasures if you're going second is... If you're able to snipe out their extra treasure, if they're forced to put it somewhere that you can that you can reach, um, that'll usually be true for maybe the last treasure that they that they pitch onto the battlefield. You might be able to force them into that, but it's very difficult. One other tip: keep your treasure carrier, in, especially in missions where there are few treasure carriers compared to total fighters in the war band. So there's a lot of treasure missions where you put six treasures down, but if there's only one. Always keep your treasure carrier babysat so that if they kill it, there's a, you know the next activation is yours unless they're using say a triple the leader triple that lets you activate right away. Uh, so the next activation is always going to be yours. So make sure that your babysitter can grab the treasure and run away. Moving on to uh, a mission I actually really like, Fleeting Glory. So this one has some really interesting decisions to it. So the first one, uh, look at your shield and then look at their hammer and their shield. So let's say we've got blue shield here, we've got their shield 18 inches away, and they've we've got their hammer, um, what is this? The hypotenuse of 11 and, um, the hypotenuse of 11 and six away. Um, look at those two deployment groups, try to figure out which one your shield is better at fighting, right? Because it's really tempting to just, your hammer takes the corner, your shield goes straight to the center, and then you kind of set things up for a center punch up. Um, you can get a lot of value by f finding opportunities to flip that script, right? If their hammer is just not as strong as their shield, why fight their shield, right? Um, now, that might sort of free them up to then have their shield come at your hammer, but you can especially if you have a lot of models, you can be kind of cagey there, right? You can have, you can move first with your hammer onto this objective, you know, try to get them to, um, you know, show their hand a little bit because if they start putting models from their shield into the center objective before you've had to commit to this corner objective, Remember, this is actually closer to your shield, even though it's more contested by their hammer. Um, you can you can have a better opportunity to go there and deal damage. Uh, the other thing that'll sort of affect that quite a bit is where the terrain is. If there's terrain between you and the center, then a lot of the time you do want your shield to come down into the corner and fight their hammer over it. The burn decision here is also really interesting. You need to think about these hammer corners is what I call them. Can you defend them from the oncoming dagger, right? So when the dagger comes on, it's got a good look at the center objective, but not that good a look, right? It's still going to be eight inches away at least. And it's got a pretty good look at the opposing player's hammer corner. So you really need to think about if, if you roll the first burn decision, you need to think about, can you defend your hammer corner from their dagger? Now that's going to depend on how much of their shield they put towards your objective, 
how each of you has balanced your deployment zones, essentially. Um, and then you also need to think about, can your dagger take their hammer corner, right? So this is, again, going to really depend on how you've balanced your deployments, essentially. It's also going to depend on terrain. And then this is also going to be true of our next mission, but it's going to depend on sort of how much you've already committed to different things. It can be a real disaster to commit a lot of things to a objective that you're not even winning unless you're forcing your opponent to commit a lot to that objective to be, take it from you and it lets you take the other two, right? So that's sort of a, a big piece for objective missions in general is um, sort of deploying your resources the correct way across the multiple objectives. For building for this mission, uh, like if you're going to a tournament that's mostly going to use Tome of Champions, uh, this mission really supports having numbers, especially in your shield. Because if you can feint towards the center, forcing them to commit to the center, and then also put power towards the, you know, towards the hammer corner, that can give you a lot of power in this mission. And so having numbers in your shield is really helpful. It's also true that because, so you get extra points in later rounds for having, for each objective, right? So the center, or the, the one objective left in round three, it's worth three points. In round four, it's worth four points. So that's seven points total. If you lose round one, tie round two, and then win both of the other two rounds, you win the game, right? Um, so that can make it so that even if you have fewer numbers than your opponent, if you're just really good at destroying them, you can absolutely win um, this, <laughs> this objective, right? Uh, this sort of mission. So think about this because um, something like classically with uh, Thundercats, right? The meme list everyone loves. Um, if you can come close to tabling your opponent in those first two rounds, as long as you just win one of those first objectives in uh, in round one, um, as long as you don't get, you know, if you don't get shut out in uh, in round two, you can win this um, just by just killing your opponent. And that's a big change that's happened in a lot of the uh, these four round missions. Nexus of Power is the other objective mission in uh, in the Tome of Champions, and it's also got a lot of really interesting um, sort of dynamics to it. So first, you've got your shield and your dagger on the board, right? And your shield is kind of pulled between three different potential responsibilities, right? The, these two back objectives and the center. And then your dagger has, again, these sort of your opponent's two back objectives or the center. Right, so each one is sort of pulled in three different directions. You're going to want to think about, I would say, round one, you should target three objectives to try to win. And then round four, you should be thinking about four objectives. Um, these home objectives, they're not going to be safe if all you do is have, say, one unit from your shield um, go towards both. And then, like, let's say we are red shield here in the center, right? If you have one and you have three fighters, if you send one towards each objective, um, your opponent's hammer oftentimes is going to be able to take both of those objectives unless you're supporting one of them with your dagger, right? Um, the same is true, you know, when your hammer comes on, you should be thinking about which objective you can steal of your opponent's. This is where numbers really matter, but also mobility matters a lot on Nexus of Power. Um, a slow warband is going to have to just target three objectives and absolutely win them. Um, so what that's going to mean is sort of the first round, you're going to you know go your back objectives and then really care about winning the center. And then you're probably going to abandon one of your back objectives um, to then take an opponent back objective and then you'll need to sort of reinforce one of yours, whichever one they've essentially not committed their hammer to, and then continue winning the center. That can be really dangerous because you can't make a mistake in terms of evaluating your opponent's ability to take objectives, right? You have to be um, really thinking about your opponent's dagger and sort of what they can take, um, you know, how effective can they be reinforcing their opponent's back objective 
how effective can they be stealing your back objective um, this 11 inch run towards the center is hard to do but it's really tempting um, because the center objective is so up for grabs uh, there's also the uh, when I played Nexus of Power at Adepticon my opponent had um, the uh, the hidden agenda of just to win the center right and so they kind of overcommitted to the center and I was able to take some of their back objectives and that was how I was able to win um, so that's another thing to, to kind of think about uh, as far as building for this um, any competitive warband is going to have some gain here although numbers really matters and again especially in your shield um, these two in general means that you know your total hitting power shouldn't necessarily be all in your shield but your numbers should be if you're playing an all tome of champions tournament um so like if your if your tournament organizer it says you're going to be mostly using toc missions it's really really worth it to put a lot of your chaff in your shield because your shield is the one that is put in these situations in these objective missions of getting stretched really thin and chaff lets you kind of survive being stretched thin in a way that just having two fighters you wouldn't even be able to claim all the objectives right so let's say you only have two fighters in your shield you have to send one here one here and then that means you have to put a dagger over here or else you just don't even get this back objective right um so having a lot of models in your shield can really help uh win these two these two objective missions in tome of championship tome of champions tournaments so let's talk about scour and trophy kills um i'm combining them here not because i don't like them i actually think they're both pretty fun missions um but because kind of they have a little bit less to diagram uh scour the most important thing in scour is at the start of the game do the math so basically let's say you have six fighters your opponent has nine fighters right obviously if you get all six of yours across and they get all nine of theirs across they win by three um if you kill one then and they kill none of yours right then you get seven points they get eight points um still not enough right so you have to kill you have to have two more kills than they have at the end of the game is essentially what you have to think about um and so that tells you sort of what your focus is going to be um scour really kind of puts the puts the onus on the person with fewer models sort of right away um the the second thing you want to do is separate all of your friendly fighters essentially into two categories right there's runners who are people who they need to get across the board before um before they give your opponent a harvest of points essentially by dying and then there's hunters right uh fighters of yours who their job is going to be to do some damage to uh take things out from your opponent um the same is true with all of your opponent's fighters you need to take a look at the soft targets and the hard targets and you need to run away from the hard targets it's completely different from how say an objective mission goes where you know you're kind of dancing around the objectives and yeah you don't want to sort of go into the hard targets necessarily but a lot of the time on objective missions and on uh, other hunter missions you have to kill your opponent's scary threats in scour that's not true you generally want to avoid them um so like i was saying before the the name of the game really is to get your liabilities across the battlefield before your opponent can harvest them um this is one where you can use if you have defensive fighters in your force for some reason uh, like cavalry uh, you should look to use them to tie up your opponent opposing hammers right so that they can't go hunting your little things very easily um, another thing you can do that was really successful for me is if you have a heavy hitter in your dagger um, you can put it in the opposing shield deployment zone to try to get kills because they come on round two and your dagger gets plus one movement so it's really easy to get into this area and then they have to deploy around it which lets you get a bunch of kills um and 
you know, scour is all about essentially every kill you get uh, really helps you. So this one's really fun also for building um, because mobile chaff really helps until it gets harvested for uh, for easy kills, right? So one of the worst things you can have in this mission is a lot of slow chaff. Um, so for example, or slow and easy to kill chaff especially. So like uh, skeletons are a little bit less are a little bit less ideal in this mission. Um, you would definitely want zombies over skeletons if you're a soul blight grave lord. Although I think that's true generally. Um, trophy kills is a really fun one when you have uh, evenly matched warbands. But essentially, you know, you add up the points values of all of the kills that you got during that battle round, and you get a point if you won it. And then you also get, um, or sorry, you get three if you win it, and then you get one extra victory point if you kill the leader. Um, trophy kills really, really favors shooting warbands because you can kind of back up, castle up, and just shoot. And then, um, like, let's say if you have a couple archers in your dagger, which is generally a good idea um, because there's a couple other missions that uh, support having archers in your dagger, you can just kind of sit back and shoot them and force them to come to you. And because you guarantee that, listen, I'm going to get a victory point in round two, no matter what, because maybe I can't shoot, shoot you off or shoot off any models in round one, but I'm going to get them low enough that I'm going to shoot them off in round two, no matter what, which forces your opponent to overcommit. Um, if you don't have any shooting, the really important thing to do is try to pounce on and take out anything that's separated from the group essentially right so if your opponent kind of moves and has a chaff unit that doesn't have any heavies supporting it or nearby um, sort of dropping down on it with a dragon something like that is really important um, that's kind of how you score uh, if you don't have any big flyers but you do have some really titanic things like a storm fiend or a doom bull um, sort of setting up these no-fly zones and having all your chaff essentially hide next to your doom bowl is really important. Um, so that's really important. Um, also, remember, we're counting points, not wounds. So a lot of versions of this mission are on the number of wounds killed. Um, so because we're counting points, it's really important to sort of keep tabs on every elite fighter on the board at all times because um, killing one and knowing when you can kill one is really important because once you kill one, it's almost impossible for your opponent to win that round. Um, so sort of weakening one down and then using it to just auto, weakening one of your opponent's elites down and then using it to just auto win a certain round is really, really valuable in this mission and something you should always be looking to do. Um, another thing sort of for that that means for building for this mission is that uh, mid-size units, again, I say this a lot, but mid-size units are a massive liability in this mission um, because, you know, unless they're very defensive, the problem is um, killing one, you immediately went, like if you kill a mid-size unit, a lot of the time they have to kill two chaff units. And a lot of the time, two chaff units are actually cheaper than a mid-size unit, right? If you're sort of running around the board with these, um, you know, 55 point gores or even 65 point, you know, blood reavers, right? And you take out sort of a squig for 140 points. Um, they can kill two blood reavers and still lose that round. And a squig is a lot easier to kill than two blood reavers that are kind of in separate parts of the battlefield, right? So mid-sized units can be um, a huge liability in this uh, in this mission, especially when they're only move four, um, because sort of getting across the board to kill something and then getting out is something that's really important. Um, using your dice is also important here if you have uh, movement abilities, because the reprise the way reprisal works with trophy kills can be really punishing for the person who is proactive um, 
because they have to use movement to get into combat and then you get to double attack on them, right? So any kind of sort of ability that gets you across the board with room to use attacks later is extremely valuable and something you should be using your wild dice to get to. Um, something, a really interesting footnote with these is resurrection abilities. So we need an FAQ for how resurrection abilities from say Night Haunt or Soulblight Gravelords or what it seems like is that Sylvaneth is going to be getting a resurrection ability soon. Um, now, right now, it appears to kind of be worded in a very specific way, right? So um, when you do a, a resurrection ability, it says that fighter is no longer counted as being as having been taken down. Um, it doesn't say anything about subtracting victory points, right? So right now, as the rules are written, um, resurrecting... So in Scour... If you kill a model, you get a point. It is resurrected. You still have that point because you've already counted the point. Now, it no longer counts as being taken down. It can run to the other side and score, and your opponent can still get that point. Uh, that's something really important to just keep in mind if you're playing against Night Haunt or Soulblight Gravelords on Scour. Um, but that ability is even more devastating in trophy kills because... Um, in trophy kills, you don't count the points until the end of the round. So if you get a kill and then they resurrect that model before the round ends, um, your kill doesn't count. You don't get the points there um, because the points aren't tallied until the end of the round when the fighter no longer counts as being taken down. So this is something where if you're facing Soulblight Gravelords or if you're facing Night Haunt um, on trophy kills, you want to either prioritize killing their leader um, so that they can't do those resurrect abilities or you want to make sure that you are um, getting your kills like right at the end so you know your first few activations should be positioning should be maybe putting damage on one of their elites that you aren't going to get a kill with um, and then anything that's going to kind of kill an easy you know an easy target an easy chaff um, that should be the very last activation you do in the round. That's very important as far as getting around those abilities. Um, those resurrection abilities really allow Soul Blight and Night Haunt to, uh, to really be in the driver's seat with trophy kills, which um, Soul Blight doesn't need it, but Night Haunt really needs it, so that's a really good buff for them. All right, so let's get to Red Harvest. With Might Makes Right, you each place three objectives with the normal objective placing rules. Then you get a victory point for each objective that you have that you're winning, right? But in addition, you score one victory point each time a friendly fighter within three inches of an objective makes an attack action that takes out down an enemy fighter within three inches of the same objective. Um, this is a really brilliant sort of, it's not a twist, right? But a really brilliant kind of uh, wrinkle that I think makes might <laughs> makes might makes right the uh, absolute best mission in the whole game um, because it uses every element of Warcry, right? Uh, you need to have board presence because of objectives, but um, it's doing the thing that sort of a lot of the newer objective missions do, which is just having more objectives. Um, so that kind of forces you into using a lot of mobility, right? Because the objectives are kind of spread across the field. Um, but it also really matters what kind of fighting power you have because you're getting points for kills. Uh, it's also really interesting because in a lot of these objective missions with a lot of objectives, archers are really important because they sit on a back objective and then shoot people off of um, more contested objectives. This kind of takes away some of that value. It's still valuable in the exact same way it was before, but giving points for winning the fight on the objective um, makes it so that you're kind of incentivized to have a lot of your hitting power in your melee troops um, because those are going to get those extra points. Um, all of that kind of makes this sort of that combination of all of those factors required to win. That's kind of what makes this my, my favorite mission. Um, as far as building to win it, it also has some really interesting dynamics, right? Where durable chaff is going to beat so a, a, 
a warband with a lot of durable chaff is going to beat a really elite warband because they're not going to get a lot of kill points on those objectives because they're not going to kill a lot of your fighters. Um, and so you're just going to outnumber them on the objectives like a normal objective mission, um, and they're not going to get those kill points. However, elite warbands do beat sort of really... <laughs> warbands full of really killy chaff, uh, what I call it. So something like Plague Monks or, um, you know, any of the any of the chaff that's just like known for its hitting power, right? Um, elites are going to beat those, elite heavy warbands are going to beat those because, um, you know, you're going to lose the first round, but you're going to get points, a lot of points for getting kills, right? Because, you know, if your opponent takes an objective, but you got a kill point on that objective, you essentially tied that objective, right? Um, so you're going to harvest a lot of kill points in this mission if you're an elite warband against a really sort of fragile but dangerous chaff warband. But that fragile but dangerous chaff warband is generally going to beat the durable chaff warband, right? Because they're going to be able to like double up on the durable chaff. They're going to get more kills um, than the kind of defensive chaff warband is going to get. And they're going to sort of get more kill points, even though they're going to be fairly equal on objectives. So uh, there's a really cool rock, paper, scissors there, which I love because at that point, a lot of it becomes sort of um, how do you sort of use your abilities and how do you kind of how do you make your matchup against the thing you're weak to a little bit better and how do you sort of make sure you shut down the thing you're good against even harder right i think that that's just a really interesting kind of give and take uh, anytime there's something where there's no one thing that's clearly the best i think you've got a really good mission um so you are going to want to just have both numbers and killing power, which is really hard to balance uh, when you're making a good list. Um, so as far as actually how to win uh, this mission, right? There's a couple essential questions, and these apply to a lot of objective missions. Um, you always want to think about in these objective missions, you know, you start by placing them, right? And that's going to depend on where the deployments are. And then after they've been placed, you need to look at what your opponent has and you need to think about which of my objectives is my opponent going to be able to contest easily. And then you have to look at their objectives and say, which of their objectives can you contest easily? And the place where you win these missions is where your opponent has essentially spread their defenses across their objectives. And that doesn't match up with what you know about your force, about which of their objectives you can contest. So if there are, if they have three objectives and they defend all three of them equally, and you have one that's really easier, a lot easier for you to contest, then you throw down onto that objective and you win because um, essentially you manage to take that objective because they haven't put enough to it. If they stack one objective thinking that that is their most vulnerable objective and you have a solid route to contesting another objective that can be a really important one to get to and that can win you the mission um so i think that that's the essential question to take into essentially all of the each player places three objective missions um but it's of course always going to be true in this one as well um this is something I mentioned with the Tome of Champions missions, but if you commit more than you need to, to an objective that's fully safe, that really hurts you elsewhere. So if you have an objective that your opponent can't contest or isn't contesting, and you just have two, you know, you've put two friends going and securing that objective, uh, that puts you at a pretty big disadvantage, right? So that's why you have to think really hard about which of your safe objectives uh, your opponent can contest. Uh, the same is true for making the decision about whether to leave an objective, right? In Warcry, if you hold an objective, you can leave it and you still hold it until one of them just shows up and take and sits on it, right? So the decision of whether or not you're safe to leave an objective is uh, can be a tough one and can uh, making that decision wrong is often what can be the difference in these games um, because, you know, 
if you lose a team fight because you decided to babysit the objective, that can lose you a game. So you need to think about whether your fighter is needed in the team fight. But if you leave to go support a team fight that you were going to win anyway, and then they go take your back objective with just some chaff unit that you could have easily killed if it had come on, um, then that can lose you a game. So those are kind of the two things to consider there. Um, it's also fun with this one because uh, you can win this, might makes right, by just having, you know, having chaff that's contesting objectives, but then just having a few really scary hammer units that uh, just hunt for kills, right? Uh, even if you don't take the objective, if you have a, um, like if you have your opponent with three things on an objective and you just rush your leader into there and you get a couple kills, your leader has essentially paid for its own points. Um, you know, not necessarily like your 250 point leader killing two 65 point things. It hasn't paid for itself literally in points, but in victory points, it has paid for itself. Um, even though it hasn't won any objectives, right? So this is something where um, you should have most of your warband thinking about the objective game, but you can absolutely win by just hunting for kills with whatever your best offensive unit is. Um, and I just think that those layers there make this a really incredible mission. Again, my favorite mission in the whole game. Uh, Vital Supplies is another really fun one from Red Harvest. Uh, because it's got some gamesmanship, right? So uh, almost always, and by the way, this is my favorite treasure mission in all of Warcry. Uh, most treasure missions I don't like, this one's really good. It has some of the same issues of a flyer can kind of imbalance things, but um, it's kind of mitigated by the fact that there's a lot of treasures and that you get to place your own treasures. Um, Gamesmanship-wise, it's really cool. So that's why I put this uh, Princess Bride. If, if you know the scene, you know the scene. If you don't, uh, you should watch the movie. Um, it, mostly, it mostly still holds up. Um, so one treasure is almost always a really obvious pick for um, what your vital supply should be because it's going to be the hardest one to take. But if it's really obvious, then obviously you won't pick it, right? Because then they'll know who to put their energy towards killing. Um, the reason why, I forgot to read it, is um, each player secret, so you put down six treasures in the normal way, then each player secretly notes down one of the treasure tokens to be their vital supply. Um, you can find the names of the treasure tokens if you want. Uh, the battle ends after four rounds. When the battle ends, both players reveal their vital supply. A player wins the battle if they have a fighter carrying their vital supply and the opponent does not. Otherwise, when the battle ends, the player who has the most fighters carrying treasure wins. So if you can take four pieces of treasure, you know, that will win you a tiebreaker if you don't get their vital supply. But it is if you manage to take their vital supply, it's fine if they take both of your non-vital supplies, right? They could be carrying four treasures and you still win carrying two if you carried the important one, right? So there's really fun gamesmanship where a lot of the time you want to be picking the obvious one, but sometimes you don't want to pick the obvious one because it's obvious. And uh, sort of playing with that can make a really fun mini game at the beginning of the game. Um, as far as building for it, uh, having multiple durable fighters is important. This is one where um, Having cavalry can actually help a lot here. Uh, cavalry on the Red Harvest board is unplayable because of the lava pits, but if you play Vital Supplies on a regular board, um, cavalry can be really good here as far as keeping your treasures while not costing too much. Um, dragons are, of course, really good for sniping your opponent's treasures before they get to pick them up um, in round one. So that's why you're gonna want at least one really high projection fighter um, hopefully, you know, one really fast fighter that doesn't have the mount room mark to go hunt down their treasure carriers. Um, I think you generally want to have a significant portion of your warband defending your vital supply, but otherwise it's really important, I think, to hunt down theirs. Um, so kind of the classic um, sort of 
<laughs> the template that I talked about in my Lessons from Adepticon video uh, is really rewarded here because uh, having sort of beefy fighters in each deployment zone that can carry treasure or hunt down and kill treasure carriers uh, is really helpful, right? So you can spread power across the entire board. Um, some essential questions to think about. One is, do you want to place all three of your treasures near your onboard warbands, or do you want to put one for pickup later, right? Because um, your opponent's mobility is really going to determine which of those two things you do, right? Because if you place all three of your treasures near your warbands that are on the board, that means you're probably going to have to pick up a treasure with a fighter that's not very, not very durable, and that can punish you. But if you put one to get picked up by your next deployment group, your opponent can just kind of snipe it later. Um, so you need to think about how, what the risk of that is versus whether you even care if it happens if you feel pretty confident about taking your opponent's vital supply. Um, the other thing here, if you're playing with four rounds, this is another one where uh, elite warbands that maybe can't necessarily pick up all their treasures easily um, if you just focus on tabling your opponent, you can win without picking up all the treasure because if they, um, you know, if they get their vital supply killed, you just win. Um, if your opponent is trying to table you, if you sense that this is happening, uh, if you use terrain to keep away from shooters and just kind of play defensively, it can really put you in the driver's seat. So this is where if your opponent's trying to table you, you can use the wait action to force them to fully commit, and then you always have at least attacks to, to uh, put some reprisal on them afterwards. Uh, so let's talk about take and hold. This is a really great sort of Timmy mission, a really great beer and pretzels mission, um, but it's also got a little bit of competitive play too, which I think is cool. Um, take and hold is the one where th there's a center objective, uh, you get a little further. Normally, it's three inches from the center. I think in Take and Hold, it's five inches. Uh, you win if your leader is within five of the objective and your opponent's is not. If both leaders aren't, then it's just classic objective rules, and it all gets counted at the end of round four. Uh, this mission is really cool because it just creates an epic team fight, a giant punch up in the middle. Uh, it makes difficult sequencing decisions about who you want to have attack first and which target you attack first but it's cool because they're difficult if you really care about optimizing but they're really easy to just ignore in casual games and just be like well i just want to smash right so i think that is just a really great sign uh building for it this is one of the missions where uh area of effect buffs and debuffs are really valuable um, it's also valuable to have killing power that's separate from your leader because if your only way to kill stuff is your leader goes in and, and kills stuff, um, that makes you extend your leader and it's really important to keep your leader alive until the end of round four, which can be pretty tough to do if, if you're just running it into combat, right? Um, you also get rewarded for having movement abilities or just general mobility in general because there's almost always one deployment group that starts pretty far away from the center of the board and get being able to get it to the center is going to be really important and if you can do that but your opponent can't that's going to reward you in a big way um, so the things to focus on while playing this mission uh, hunting down and killing or just forcing out your opponent's leader right because you don't have to kill their leader if you can body block them away from the center, um, if you can just tie them up in a fight off the board and then they just can't get to the center, um, or not off the board, but in the corner of the board and then they just can't get to the center, that can be really valuable. Um, another thing to remember, your leader doesn't have to join the fight until pretty late, right? So you can spend the first two rounds protecting your leader and hunting theirs and then just move it into the center right at the end of the game. Um, this generally rewards you for rushing the center and taking control of the center, but not every fighter has to do that. Um, I played this once where it was a melee warband against a um, shooty warband, and the melee warband ended up winning, but it was really close because 
the melee war band rushed the center and then the shooty war band just spent the whole time just shooting them down not even engaging right um so that's where it can really help to have a few fighters running up and actually going and chasing down the archers and trying to kill them right um the main thing being to protect your leader in the center right so a lot of the time let's say if you stop an enemy fighter from projecting power into the center from shooting into the center that's just as valuable as having a body in there um, the other thing that's important to think about is sort of the the value of body blocking pre preventing your opponent from getting numbers into the center there um, can't can't stress this enough this one's a really fun one uh, the three best missions from red harvest i think are probably the three best missions in the whole game um maybe vital supplies is a little bit behind some of the tome of champions ones but i think take and hold and might makes right are pretty incredible uh let's talk about catacombs real quick uh diminishing gains is i think my favorite one from catacombs it makes for a really fun two stages to the game uh diminishing gains is you start with a center objective and then you also place two more objectives in uh, positions that are pretty safe. Then, you know, there's, you, you get points for sort of winning objectives, right? And then you get to burn objectives later in the match. So um, you start off with kind of a race to win the center objective and you want a warband that can, that can actually win that race and then actually um, sort of win the fight at the objective. But the second half of the game is kind of, it's less about the center objective, although you're still fighting there, but it's more about a battle to protect your home objectives from the reinforcement rules in catacombs. Because in catacombs, remember, reinforcements can come in from any door. So your opponent has a lot of leeway to kind of harass your home objectives. Um, it can even make sense if you are winning the center objective, it can make a lot of sense to just reinforce your home objectives to not even put your reinforcements in a position to attack any objective uh, just to kind of uh, take up the doors and body your opponent out of uh, contesting your home objectives um, and one thing that's cool about diminishing gains is sort of mobile hitting power wins stage one so like dragons are obviously really good in stage one you just get to the objective right away in round one and then in round two, they have to use movement to get there, whereas you can just use hits to get there, um, or like use attacks once they've gotten there. Um, however, durability and numbers win stage two, right? Because being able to kind of spread yourself thin, get to um, choose which objectives get burned, um, because if you take an opposing objective that means you get to burn the center objective if you're losing it, right? Um, you get to sort of be in the driver's seat for what gets burnt. Um, and so durability and numbers kind of win stage two. This is one of the only missions where durability really matters. And that's just in um, surviving in a lot of different places on the board over the course of five long rounds. So uh, that makes this one a pretty fun one. Uh, I think the really important thing to think about is to take a really good look at your opponent's reserve group, right? Do they have a model in reserves that can single-handedly take an objective, right? Like one of your two home objectives. Um, because if they do, that has to really change how you play the game. Um, the other thing is true though in reverse, right? Do you have one model in reserve that can single-handedly take an objective? Um, and if so, you have a huge incentive to, to go do exactly that, right? To go put it um, right on your opponents, to sort of use your very first reinforcement to just put it within striking distance of an opponent's objective. Um, so yeah, a, a lot of fun with this one, but the main thing is to take a look at your reserves, right? Because the, the main strategy is obvious right away. It's like you're rushing towards the center, um, but just keep your opponent's reserves in mind the whole time. Running battle is a cool one um, because this is sort of the original for uh, Reaper trophy kills. It seems like they really like this setup. Running battle is um, you count up the wounds. Uh, yes, the wounds characteristics of fighters from their warband that were taken down that battle round. The player with the lower score 
gets one victory point. So um, this is a little bit different from the one in the in Tome of Champions, but it's similar, right? Um, also, so like trophy kills, this favors uh, speed and it favors shooting in a big way. However, in Catacombs, uh, you can be really careful to just hide in the kind of twisting hallways to stay away from shooters. Um, so if your opponent has a shooting warband and you don't, uh, you want to really be kind of creeping towards them while staying in the, um, you know, in the tunnels essentially for the first couple rounds until you know you're in position to just pop out and charge them. Um, so just be really careful not to expose yourself until you're ready. However, one thing to think about is a lot of the time it'll take two turns to achieve that, right? So a lot of the time in the round where you pop out, you'll get to them to start combat, but they'll just be shooting you and they'll probably win that round. Um, and then you need to have two rounds left to win both of those rounds. Now you're in melee combat. So make sure that you kind of spring your trap by round three, um, because if you don't spring it until round four, you'll probably lose. Uh, if you are the shooting war band and you're playing against a melee war band, remember to sort of put yourself in a position where they have to spend as long as possible running from cover towards you, right? Put as much open ground as possible between you and them, um, though I'm sure most shooting players know that already. Uh, the shooting team, though, again, like trophy kills, the shooting team is really in the driver's seat here. All right, so we're down to the base game. Uh, video is getting a little long, but I'll, I'll try to still give these uh, missions the love they deserved, especially because Bloodmarked, I think, is really cool. Um, you have a lot of strategy for how to choose your mark, and building towards this is really interesting. So a lot of warbands, their most durable fighter is also their best offensive fighter. And the reason for that is that most warbands, their leader model or their most expensive model is just fulfilling both roles, right? Um, with Bloodmarked, you have some incentive to split those roles. Um, so this gives significant value to say mid-sized cavalry like Saurus Knights or Blissbarb Seekers who can be running away, have a, having a lot of wounds, being the bloodmarked fighter, but also shooting, you know, while they're running away. Um, if you don't have something like that, right, you have a really tough decision to make over whether you want one of your chaff fighters to be it and you just kind of bubble wrap that, wrap that chaff fighter in other chaff, or whether your sort of big scary leader is going to be your bloodmarked fighter. And then if it is, are you going to have it fighting? Because if you don't, you'll probably lose a lot of fights elsewhere on the board um, because you don't have most of your offense there. So one thing that can happen to say, like uh, before they got all those buffs, one thing that would happen to Stormcast on this mission was you would just find that um, you had killed everything but their bloodmarked fighter and they had killed your bloodmarked fighter and nothing else because, you know, you're just kind of at this disadvantage as far as choosing your fights there. Um, so there's a lot to think about with what you choose and I think that makes this a fun game. Um, and as far as building to win this game, you know, like I said, this is one of the very few that encourages you to have your offense and your defense kind of led by different models. Um, it also really rewards you um, running the kind of multiple elites and then all chaff because it lets you kind of, you choose one of your elites as your blood marked and then the other two are hunting and then your chaff are body blocking them from getting to your blood marked fighter. Um, that can be really helpful or your chaff are running up and tying up their blood marked fighter so it can't run away from your elites essentially. Um, so this really rewards the kind of three elites and all chaff, or um, if you're feeling fancy, two elites. That way you're guaranteed to have one of them on the board, and then your hunting elite comes on um, in round two. Sudden death is a fun one too. So this is one where each player only puts one objective down. So you put it obviously in your safest part of the board. And then it's basically capture the flag. Um, this one's really fun. It's got a few cool questions that you ask yourself. The first is, can I capture it without fighting? Can I rush in so much chaff 
um, that I just win the objective before they've you know gotten a chance to kill it all, right? Um, this can be sort of doable if you have stuff like giant rats or if you have like spiders, um, you know, anything cheap and fast. Um, and it can be interesting in games where if they've sort of put a lot of stuff towards going and capturing your objective um, without defending their own and their stuff isn't very fast. Um, the other question though is if you can't do that, can you, do you need to capture it by just crushing them, right? By essentially killing all of their things by so much that they just don't have a lot of fighters left and then you kind of through attrition you're finally left at the very end you know you've played like seven rounds and now you finally have both objectives um each warband is going to have a different answer there and probably a combination of a few right you're going to want to kill a few things and then run in and capture right something like that um so you want to think pretty hard about who is holding your objective and who is trying to go capture. Uh, if you have archers, obviously they're best for holding the objective and trying to shoot down your opponents capturing things. Um, but sometimes you have to make a decision, right? So you have your objective holders, but your objective capturers, essentially, are either attacking their objective capturers, right, to keep them from coming in to get yours, or they're going for the objective itself. And what sort of what you have to consider there is basically where you're coming in on the board um, versus kind of what your opponent starts moving right away. If their sort of biggest models are coming at you right away, um, you know, sometimes it can be the best thing to just avoid fighting them and just go around them and try to capture, right? And then it's on them to actually hunt you down before you capture their objective. Um, a cool thing about this one is almost any competitive warband is going to have game here. It's going to function well here because um, there's just a lot of different strategies, right? Do you castle up and shoot? Do you kind of descend down with your dragons? Do you try to overwhelm with chaff? Um, every competitive warband is sort of leaning towards one of those plans anyway, and a lot of different plans work here as long as they're executed well. Uh, drawn and quartered, I think, is one of the best teaching missions, which I think makes it really cool. Um, and it's a little bit similar to Sudden Death, except, you know, there's two objectives. Whoever has the most points from capturing objectives wins, right? Um, one thing to think about with this one, so unlike Sudden Death, it's a lot harder to defend both of your home objectives because you're spread a little bit more thin. So one place where you can kind of get an edge is thinking about what routes your opponent is taking between deployment and your objectives. And if they're forced to take the same route towards your objectives for both objectives, it can be better to defend that route through terrain, like a choke point, than it is to defend your home objectives. Um, the same being true kind of for assaulting your opponent's objectives. If you can kind of surprise them with where you come from, that can get you a lot of value. Uh, as far as building to it, turn one move abilities can be absolutely game breaking in this mission um, because you, uh, if you can, you know, your opponent might not have time to body block routes or spread out across their two objectives yet if you're just in there right away. So like Flesh Eater Quartz is really good at this because um, if their leader does their sort of giant movement ability and then ghouls are already pretty fast, sometimes you can be overwhelming them on their home objective round one and taking their objective round one, and then they just don't have time yet to punish you for that by running into your, your objectives. Um, so having turn one movement abilities, they're good in general, and this mission is part of why. Uh, four rounds, of course, kind of mitigates this slightly. In the base game, this is a three-round mission, but, um, you know, there's a lot of sort of suggestions that you use base game missions that say three rounds and you just make them four. And uh, I would say this mission is one of those that's a lot more balanced when you do that. Finally, I want to talk about the kind of deployment takedown missions. So these are Dominate, Shock and Awe, and Vanquish. Uh, these are the ones where you have to just take down an entire deployment group. I think they're really fun. I think they're like a really important, you know, for all of us who just sort of played by drawing a random card, 
you, chances are that since there's three of them, you drew one of these at some point. Um, so I think they're a really classic part of the game. I think they're really fun. Um, kind of the considerations with them. I think the first one I always think about, you look at your target group, right? Can you get away with only fleeing with one model and sending the other two to help fight? If Is that too dangerous? Is the one model you would flee with too, too vulnerable? And the reason for that is every model that's sort of fleeing is not contributing, right? Um, and can cause you to lose uh, lose team fights that make it so that your opponent wins the general fight and is able to come get you. Um, the other thing to think about is with each group, are you in better position to body block for your target group or are you in better position to tag opposing hunters, right? Um, if you are spending kind of a lot of time with the basically the less effective version of that, uh, that will cost you the game in these. So for example, if you have a deployment group that's coming on that's not near the unit you're fleeing with, but you try to go reinforce them, you're gonna waste a lot of time moving that is going to mean you're not putting damage on your opponent, which is going to put them in the driver's seat as far as avoiding having damage where they don't want it on their target and being able to get to your target and put damage on it. Um, so yes, there are a lot of times when it's correct to be fighting things that aren't in your opponent's target group, but most of the time you want to avoid doing that um, in an ineffective way, right? So you only want to be fighting your opponent's non-targets when they're a threat to come get your target. Um, and Otherwise, you want to be just taking down their targets. Um, this is another one that rewards balanced deployments for the most part, unless you put a specific one of these in a tourney pack, right? So if you're, if you're a tournament organizer and you're setting up a tournament and you uh, put dominate in your deployment or in your tournament pack, you like really heavily um, reward the, uh, the players for just stacking one deployment group. So if you want to play these, and I think you should, they're a classic part of Warcry, I would generally suggest uh, announcing that you'll pick a random one of the three of them so that your players don't know which one is going to happen. And uh, that kind of will uh, suggest to people that they should have fairly balanced deployment groups. So, uh, quite a bit to cover there um sort of there's a lot of different types of objectives in warcry but i hope that kind of talking about the essential questions with each one of them kind of helps you think about um what it looks like to play the objective versus what it looks like to just kind of be randomly moving forward and attacking your opponent and uh, why that matters as far as sort of winning the game um the ways in which you know you can you can win a match of warcry without having dominated your opponent. Um, and you can do that quite often. Um, I see a lot of people talk about some of the, um, you know, some of the NPE factions in the game, like a lot of the shooting factions and talk about how OP they are. Um, and it's funny because a lot of the OP factions just can't play these objectives to save their lives, can't play the missions to save their lives. But if you also aren't playing the missions, then uh, there's, they don't have to, right? And you don't pressure them to get onto the mission. So for example, an all shooting force, they can't shoot you off objectives and win those objectives at the same time. So if you're just trying to close the gap with them and they're just getting to shoot you, um, they will win right? But if you are playing the objectives while they sit there shooting you, uh, they're in a really tough spot because you either get the points or they come in there because they have to get onto the objective and then they're helping you get into melee range with them and then you get to win. Um, so there's, that's just kind of a small example of how just kind of playing these, playing the missions can really help you win, um, even against kind of an overwhelming war band. So, I'm gonna be back with kind of more Warcry stuff. I'm gonna kind of try to cover everything that is still relevant with a kind of new expansion on the horizon um, because, you know, there's a lot of games to play before then. 
Um, it's I'm pretty doubtful that the expansion comes before kind of a slate of tournaments that's happening um, around, you know, around, at least around the U.S. this summer. And so I think that there is a lot to cover as far as kind of playing for those tournaments, uh, this being some of it. And uh, I'll talk about list building as well, um, especially because, you know, list building might get totally revamped after uh, the new <laughs> the new expansion comes out, or it might be the same. But uh, something like this with objectives should be the same. So uh, until those other videos come out, may all your roles be crits.